So, uh, how, how many of you like to eat? Okay, just, just, just go ahead and raise your hand. Everybody else, you're lying. You know that you do. You're just like, don't want people to think that you're a glutton. That's really what it is. So, hey, we're, uh, the reason I, I asked about that is today's message is going to be um, not just about food, but about a table, about the family table. We've been in a series called We Are Family and talking about what it means for us as uh, those of us that are followers of Jesus, um, what does it mean that we are part of a family, that the church is a family? And so we talked at, at the beginning, we saw people uh, take their next step of faith and we welcome people into the family as they express their faith and went public with baptism. Uh, we supported each other, served one another last week. Um, by the way, just want to say thank you to everybody that donated, everybody that volunteered last week. We gave out hundreds of backpacks and I think almost all of those are gone now. As of today, they're probably all gone. Yeah, you can put your hands together. And today we're going to talk about uh, being at the family table, at the family table. Our message series, we've been preaching um, through the, uh, a passage in Acts, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. And this is our last sermon for this series. And then next week we're going to do Breaking bread, which uh, today's message is going to help explain a little more of the significance, the why behind doing that. And then the next week after that, we're going to be kicking off a brand new series that I'll tell you about at the, at the end of this message. So let's read together out of Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. It says, so those who accepted his message, meaning Peter, Peter had preached about Jesus. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about that day, 3000 people were added to them or added to the family of God through faith in Jesus. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And then fear came over everyone, and many signs and wonders were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God, having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. So this whole passage, when you get this picture of the life of these uh, early believers and really a picture of what our life is meant to be at, as the church, you see that um, it, it's a growing family. New people are being added in. And so um, today I'd like for us to focus in, let's look back at, at verse 42 again, on uh, one particular phrase, and we're going to explain the meaning, the meaning of that. It says, they devoted themselves to four things, the apostles teaching to the fellowship. And we're going to talk about the third one today, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. So I'd like to read a quote to you about, um, uh, about this idea of being around the table. And so when you hear the phrase breaking bread, maybe you've, you've got a lot of things that, that come to, to your mind, but today after this message, you'll have a, a deeper understanding. But I'd like to read you a quote um, that says this, it's not gonna be on your screen. It says, at the table, we learn what it means to be family, how to live in responsible and loving relationships. Through the table, we live our neighborliness, our citizenship. We express our allegiance to particular places and communities, and we claim our sense of home and belonging. Now, I, you know, every, everyone, your, your home circumstances are, are different, but for a lot of people, there's a lot of significant things that happened around tables, if you think about it. Um, the, 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 di the, the kitchen table, maybe you've got one of those like kitchen dining room combos. There's a lot of great conversations that happen around that table or around the dining room um, as you discuss, hey, here's the things that have happened in my life. Here's what's been going on today as you make plans. Um, the picnic table. There's a lot of great things in the backyard. Imagine the conversations, the laughter, the joy. How about the coffee table? Well, a lot of great things happen around a coffee table. I know a lot of y'all end up at Starbucks. And so there's a lot of tables in our life. And if you think about it, a whole lot of, of great conversations and living happen around tables. 
And you may think well, we're gonna have a whole message about like tables and eating and the answer is yes. And here's gonna be one of the most surprising things for you is Jesus desires for us as a church to use the things that are common and everyday in our lives in order to, to live out our faith as disciples. So the, the good thing is you have to eat, right? I mean, you have to eat. So it's not like you have to add something different to your schedule. Like, oh man, it's another thing I have to do. Instead, I hope after today that you'll see that how you can turn something as common as eating into an opportunity for discipleship to grow with each other as an opportunity for evangelism as you reach out to people who are not at the family table and how it can just be a place of, of joy. And so um, let's talk a bit about that today. Uh, I wanna give you a little background to the phrase breaking bread. Um, so first, uh, Mark chapter eight, verse six. Here's a little background to it. So when you hear the phrase breaking bread for Jews, it was a very common expression that represented a blessing and a sharing of a common meal. So if somebody said, hey, let's break bread together. What that would mean is, Let's share a meal, let's eat together, let's hang out. Let's praise God for what he's provided for us and eat. Here's an example um, uh, from Jesus. It says, then he, Jesus, commanded the crowd to sit down on the ground, ta uh, taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke the loaves and kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. So they served the loaves to the crowd. So G in this instance, it's just a common thing. Now, it, this was a miracle, but Jesus breaking the bread, that, was, that would have been something very familiar in this society. It's what happened right before the meal. Kind of like it for uh, many people, right before a meal, people often say a blessing. God, thank you for this meal. Thank you for providing for us. And then we'll eat. It's a part of the rhythm. It was just like that in Jesus' day. So when you see the phrase breaking bread, it's often talking about something just that common, sitting around a table, eating together. But for the church, there also became a, a deeper meaning beyond just the common meal. And also Jesus leads us to this understanding as well. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. So it says, and he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So in this moment, this was during the, the, the final meal that Jesus shared with his, uh, with his disciples. It was a Passover meal and he did something that would have been common, but he gave it an uncommon meaning. In this moment, Jesus took this breaking of the bread and said, from now on, when you see this, this is gonna have a much deeper significance in your life because it represents what I'm about to do for you. You know, maybe you're here, I don't wanna take it for granted. What, did, what was Jesus pointing to? Jesus was pointing to the fact that he had came to lay down his life and that he was gonna be broken, that he was gonna be nailed upon a cross and he was gonna die on behalf of sinners like you and I. And, and he said, every time from this point forward, when you gather for this purpose and you break the bread, you're gonna remember me. You're gonna remember what I've done for you. And so when we come to the book of Acts, um, what we see is that these two meanings, the, the common breaking of bread and the meal, and also this uncommon me, uh, meaning uh, of representing and pointing to Jesus, that they, that they come together and you see both of them happening in the life of the church. You see the believers that they're not only gathering for a common meal together, but they also gather to break bread and celebrate what Jesus has done for them. And I wanna talk a little bit about um, how we can do that. So let me give you an example of when you see both of these coming together in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, verse seven. It says, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the early church began meeting on Sundays to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So they're gathered together for worship. On the first day of the week, we assembled to do what? Break bread. Paul spoke to them and since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. Now, little side note, um, I promise I've never extended a message to midnight. It just hadn't happened and y'all people might start passing out. But um, so this first meeting, they gathered to break bread. And, and the meaning here is they, they, they gathered for that special purpose of breaking the bread to remember what Jesus had done for them 
Church, we need to be reminded day in and day out, week in and week out of what Jesus has done for us. This reason that they were dedicated to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread, because there's not a day that goes by that we don't need to be reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. The fact that we're sinners, that we are broken, but he was broken on our behalf so that we could be healed. And that together by partaking of the bread, we're demonstrating our unity as a family. We're saying something. We're saying, guess what? Everybody here, we're all sinners saved by grace. Each and every one of us need grace. And, and that's the thing that, that we have in common. But then it moves on after verse seven, and now it talks about the, the second meaning of, of breaking bread, the more common meaning. It says, so he preaches to midnight, and uh, I guess they, they made it. And they, it says, after going upstairs, breaking the bread and doing what? Eating. Paul conversed a considerable time until dawn, and then he laughed. So now you see this second meaning of which it's just this common, they were sharing a meal together. And so throughout the book of Acts, you see both of these things happening, that they had this special meal, the Lord's Supper, but then they also just shared common meals with each other. And I want to talk a, a, a bit about the significance of what it means for us to share meals together. And next week when we do breaking bread, we're going to do like the early church and we're gonna do both of those at the same time. We're not only gonna share a, a meal to, to fill our stomachs, but we're also going to uh, have a meal that, that speaks to our souls and celebrates the Lord's Supper. And so we'll be doing both of those next week. But we learned something about the life of the early church, about how they, they took breaking bread, how they were around the table. And there's four things I want us to see. And, and then I want to, to make some application, some really practical things of how we can take this and begin applying this as a church. The first thing I want us to see is how frequently they met together. The frequency. Acts 2.46, look back there. We're gonna just break the, these uh, couple verses down. Acts 2.46, it says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread from house to house. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. Not just some days, but every day. You know what that tells me? You don't hang out with someone purposefully unless you actually like them, right? Now, some of you have to hang out with people you don't like because you go to work, right? And, and, and that just happens. You get in circumstances where you don't necessarily get to choose who you're hanging out with. And if you work somewhere and you like people you work with, then that's awesome, that's good. Um, that, that's a blessing to you. But the early church, they were choosing to hang out every day. And this is what I know, that you've gotta like people to hang out with them. And you've got to, to, to really, now it's going to be messy, it's going to be fun, it's going to be the whole nine yards. But the fact that they took time to meet together every day and they broke bread shows that this was a priority for them. Now, before we move forward, you may be thinking, it's like, so that means as a church, we have to gather every single day, like, you know, together. No, okay, let's not miss something. The book of Acts is describing what they did. Okay, it's describing their life together. Um, it's not always telling us this is what you have to do. So this is not like a new law, a new command, like, oh, well, I didn't meet with people from church today. So, you know, I guess God's mad at me. No, 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 that's not the point. But this is the point. If we're gonna grow as disciples, if we're gonna grow together, grow together as family, we've got to rub elbows with each other. It has to be something that it stands beyond just like a Sunday morning thing. It has to be something that's happening during the week. And they actually grew in their love for each other. See, we can't truly appreciate each other and, and understand each other, know what's going on in each other's lives if we don't interact with each other. If we don't have time that we actually are, are realizing when something's wrong. You know, when you start to have been around someone for a while, you start to pick up on things, right? You know, we're real good at hiding stuff when, uh, to, to people who are not around a lot. But the people that know you the best are like, mm, something's wrong. And you're like, man, they know it, right? And that's a good thing for us. So the first thing is they, they met frequently and, the, and 
as a church, we, we want to be people that are looking to regularly meet with each other, regularly hang out with each other, to be with each other, to sit around the family table. And notice number two is the location of where they met. So it says, look back at Acts 2, 46. It says, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and they broke bread, where? From house to house. You know, inviting people into your home, there's a, a certain like intimacy there, right? Uh, when, when you're inviting somebody in, you're just inviting them into your world, so to speak. And um, the closer you get with people, the, the more raw that becomes, right? Uh, let's think about it. You, you ever had somebody come over the first time and uh, man, you, you try to clean up everything, right? I mean, you're trying to make it look good. You're like, and, they, and they're walking in and they're like, I'm not inviting them to my house. It's looking like this, right? But after you know them for a while, eventually they show up and like now they're like stepping over diapers and like everything else. And you're like, oh, just come on in. And you got like a bandana on your head and you're like, come on, right? That happens because of common life together. That happens because of closeness. And you're inviting people into your home. You're inviting people in to say, hey, come share life with me. See me in my environment. Church, we, we need that. There's a reason like we have, have life groups and, and many of our life groups meet in homes. And the reason we do that is not because there's something magical about a home, but we're at least trying to, to create intimacy, trying to create where we can be in an environment where we get to know each other. But for many of us, we, we don't, that's a part of our faith that is, is, is lacking. We may have the large group experiences, but we're missing out on some of these closer intimate gatherings together. So they met together every day. They're meeting from house to house. The third thing I want you to see is their attitude about it. It wasn't like, ugh. Oh, I got to hang out with those people. I got to invite somebody over. The preacher says we got to hang out with people, right? Like, remember, they, they wanted to do this. They, they started to see this was good for them. You, you know, we're created for relationship. We're created to be people that are in community with each other. And, and so their attitude was, was one of joy. Listen to what it says, Acts 2, 46 through 47. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God. So I wanna say something about, about joy. You know, when you read through the book of Acts, you, you will start to see that the early church started to meet persecution. They started to meet troubles as they went through. So how in the world do they meet together and still have joy? It's because joy transcends happiness. See, happiness is based on what's happening in our lives. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is something that sustains us through every season. One reason that we have to gather together at the family table, gather together with other people, is so that we can be reminded of our joy that is grounded in Jesus. That no matter what's happening in our lives, that joy is still possible for us. That joy is something that he has for us. And notice this, that it says that they had also a humble attitude. As they, as they met with each other, and here's what you start to see. You know, if, if, if you started gathering with other people right here in this church and you started learning about each other and sharing about each other, you start to be humble because you realize that we're, we're all the same. We all struggle. We all need grace. We all are, are walking with the Lord. And we're humbled by the fact that God's grace has even been shown to us. We're humbled at the fact that God loves us. And when we gather with one another, I look out and I see other people that God's grace has been poured out on. It's not just me, but it's them. And what did they do? It, it led to praise. It led to them singing praise to God and saying, God, you're great. God, you're wonderful. God, I love you. And that happened. That was their, their attitudes and the last thing I want you to see before we kind of move and start talking about how to apply this is the impact that their gatherings had. So you're like, what kind of impact did them doing life as family actually have on the world around them? 
Now, let's just back up for a second. Remember, this, this started with a group of 120 people that were following Jesus. And now there's 3,000 plus 120, all right? And they're following after Jesus. And it's this group of people that turned the world upside down. It's this group of people that, that began just living out their faith so that more and more people came to follow after Jesus. And we're, we're here today because they were living out their faith in ways that, that drew people to Jesus. So this is what it says. Notice the impact. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God, having favor with all people. Look at this last phrase. And every day the Lord added to them those who are being saved. Every day single day. Now, I don't know about you, but that last phrase is one of the most exciting things. It's the reason I come back to this passage all the time. So there's 3,000 people, but then every day there are people that were far from God, that, that they're finding hope in Jesus. Every day, people that had the chains of sin, those chains are being dropped. Every day, people that felt alone and isolated in the world, that they are finding a family. Every day, people that did not think that they could experience grace were experiencing grace. Isn't that amazing? Each and every day. Now, now notice, what were the people doing? It just seems like they're just kind of, they're, they're devoted to the apostles' teaching. That means not only listening to it, but applying it. That means it was people living out their faith. And, and they're, they're experiencing fellowship and they're gathering around the table. They're remembering the gospel and they're, they're celebrating and people are attracted to that. Have you ever just seen like a group of people and, and they just seem happy and it just makes you want to be around them? You know, growing up, I, I mean, I had a, a great home life, but I also had some friends that like, I loved hanging out at their house because it was like a blast to hang out there, right? You know, uh, my, my friend Seth, okay? Um, he, they had a lot of people in his family, a lot of kids. And honestly, it was like kind of chaos. I'm an only child. So walking in there was like, whoa, what's happening, right? And, and everybody's like running around, it's crazy. And the, you know, it's, it, but it was so fun. We loved conversations. We'd sit around the table, we'd joke, we'd just have a great time, right? There's something attractive to that. You get drawn, you get drawn to that table. You get joined to that, uh, drawn to that kind of uh, environment. Church, what I'm saying is that the world is looking to be drawn to those tables. They're looking to be drawn to tables that are filled with believers that are just doing life together. So what would happen if, if we as the church of Jesus began just taking common everyday activities like eating and, and we said, we're gonna infuse it with a, a deeper purpose? And I wanna talk a, a, about a few of those purposes. One, what if you just made it a priority that at least once during the week that you were gonna gather with some other people that shared your faith with a, with a purpose, with the purpose of this, we're gonna hang out with this kind of attitude so that we can grow together, do life together. Now, here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that every time you get together, you need to sit down and have a Bible study. That's a great thing to do. Sometimes it just means you need to sit down and you need to laugh. You need to sit and you need to say, oh man, let me tell you about what's happening in my life. The good, the bad. Man, I need you guys to pray for me. Or maybe it's just, you just need to sit and just be around people, plain and simple. So one of my challenges is this, would you be willing to, to this week and the weeks to come, would you just be willing to gather around some kind of table for the purpose of, of just celebrating and doing life with other people that follow after Jesus? Would you just take that, that challenge up? Maybe that, some of y'all, maybe you're like an introvert and you're like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. I promise it's good for you. Um, it, it is. I understand, I understand that, that draw. Would you be willing just to gather? It could be any kind of table. Maybe it's a coffee table. Maybe it's just calling somebody and it's not a meal, but you're just sharing a cup of coffee and, and talking with a few people. And, and how's that gonna happen? You may be thinking, well, nobody ever asked me to come and do that. Maybe you just need to ask some other people. Maybe you just need to call somebody and say, hey, would you join me for coffee? And they say, no, I can't do it today. Say, okay, well, when can we do it, right? Just 
Just don't give up because we need these relationships in our lives. So one of the challenges I'd love for us to have as a church is let's begin making the table just a picture of what our life is together. And when you gather together, don't just always talk about like the surface level stuff. Sometimes let's, let's talk and encourage each other. It may be that, that God's put a verse on your heart and somebody being sharing and you can share from scripture and encourage them, pray with each other. You can talk about life and you can celebrate celebrate how God's answering prayer, or maybe at that table, you just need to be reminded of the grace of Jesus. Be reminded of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. But here's the second thing I want to say to you uh, is, is application. So not only to make it a weekly part of your rhythm to share a table with others that share your faith, but also to begin seeing the table as a place to invite people that don't share your faith. So I don't, I don't know for how many of you grew up in church, but, but for me, the, the way that I learned about doing evangelism, and please don't hear, I'm not downing this, I'm just gonna give you a different perspective, was that on a certain night of the week, we would go out and we would go knock on a door and show up and be like, hey, can I talk to you? If you died today, would you go to heaven? And people were like, uh, yeah, like what, you know, and, and, and honestly, I, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll be honest, like that kind of freaks me out. That's not the way I'm wired, okay? Like, and if somebody comes to my house and just shows up and says that, I'm like, I'm, I might not even open the door. I'm just gonna be honest, you know, that's me, all right? Maybe you're very comfortable with that. You're like, somebody shows you, like, oh, come on in, that's right, yeah. Okay, that's not everybody. And, and so I think a lot of us, we think of like sharing our faith and living out our faith. That's what comes to our mind when we think about evangelizing people. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place. It absolutely can have a place. What, what I'm proposing is to use something as common as sitting at a table and begin inviting people, not only that share your faith, but people that don't share your faith and begin having conversations. Because this is what I've discovered. The best way to share your faith is in relationship with people. The best way that, that people, that, cause people have questions and, how, and, and they, people wanna know that we actually care about them as people, not just simply to, uh, to share a message and then go away from them. So my challenge is this, would you be willing to share the table, share a table with someone that doesn't share your faith and just to talk? just to say, hey, here's what my life is about. But you know what? There's a lot of people that are looking for hope in this world and they're just, they're looking for somebody that can point them the way. And you never know how conversations over coffee could be a pathway that leads people to Jesus. That a meal, inviting someone into your backyard for a picnic could be a pathway for them coming to Jesus. So one of my favorite guys in scripture is a guy named Matthew. He's also called Levi. He was a tax collector. Tax collector, so that was like a dirty word back in, in this day. And, and, he, and G, one day he's sitting at his little tax office doing his thing. And Jesus comes up to, to Matthew and says, hey, follow me, come and follow me. And Matthew does, like everything changes for Matthew in that day. But what I love is the very next thing that Matthew does. You know what Matthew does? He throws a party and he invites all of his tax collector and sinner friends. Because you know what? Matthew knew how to do something. He knew how to party. That's how, what he knew how to do, okay? So he knew how to party, but now he had a different kind of party. He was partying with Jesus there. See, he not only invited his friends to be there, but he invited Jesus to come. And, and, and so Matthew took what was really common for him, what came naturally for him and said, you know what? We're gonna have people gather around this table. We're gonna have people come here so they can interact and so they can meet Jesus. See, I wonder what would happen if each and every one of us that follow Jesus, if we began just taking what seemed like common moments Meals that we have to eat and we started sharing them with other people. But not just to share a meal, but for the purpose of doing life together, for the purpose of growing in our faith together and the purpose of extending our faith and our relationship with other people. So would you be willing to gather around a table 
Would you be willing to uh, invite someone over into your home, uh, invite people over, a group of people? Maybe for you, the step is that you need to join one of our groups at, right here at church. Maybe you're not really good at creating groups. You just need to find a, find a group. We have groups that meet all through the week. That could be a great step for you. And you know what you start to find is that maybe that one meeting becomes more common. I'll, I'll just give an encouragement. There's a, a number of life groups that, that we have meeting at the church that um, they don't just meet on the night that their life group's meeting. I see them doing all kinds of other things. They're going out to meals together. They're going to bowl. They're, they're doing things that are, that are common to them. I think that's exactly what this passage is talking about. They're breaking bread. They're taking something common, but then being together is representing their life together as Jesus. So would you be willing maybe to join a group? Maybe just to call a few people to come hang out? Maybe it's surrounded, I won't give you an idea, maybe it's an activity you love. Maybe there's something you love doing and you're like, let me just gather some people around. We're going to do this together. Maybe, maybe you're like, hey, I want to I wanna get in shape. I want to work out. Why don't you call some people and say, hey, let's do that together. Let's just hang out. Maybe you love sports. Hey, let's hang out. Let's do sports, but let's not just do sports. Let's talk about life. Let's do life together. Let's break bread together and see how Jesus can move into everyday rhythms of our life. I want to pray for us. Pray that, that God will open our opportunities for us to be able to do this and to be able to invite people that are far from God into these relationships as well. Let's pray together. Father, this message, it seems, it seems so simple. It, 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 in some ways, it seems easy. But God, I pray that we will take these opportunities. I believe that you desire for us to live out our faith in the co common rhythms of life, sharing meals with people people that share our faith so we can encourage each other. So God, I pray for that, that those that maybe feel alone in their faith, that God, that you will help them to form some relationships with others um, that can be centered around the table and help us to grow in our faith, help us to encourage each other, to lift one another up, to pray, to do life together. But God, I also pray that we would have our eye not only to those that share our faith, but God, for those that are unsure about you. God, maybe those that are looking for hope in this world. God, I pray that we would be a church and we would be individuals that always have an open seat ready for people that are far from you. That we would be intentional, just like Matthew was, of bringing his friends that didn't know you. And Jesus, I pray that you would just show up in our meetings. They wouldn't just be simple gatherings where we don't really ever get to praising you or talking about you, but, but God, that we would have significant change, life change, that, that your, your scriptures would be shared, that prayers would be offered, that joy would be present. God, so that we would just truly do life together in a way that honors you, God, that pleases you. And God, I pray that we will begin seeing more and more that every day, right here in this community, that more and more people that are curious about the faith, that they'll be added to this community of faith. They'll be added to your kingdom. God, I pray that we can look back at this moment and see how you began working through what seems to be so ordinary and so common. But God, I pray that you would infuse it with meaning and change and life change because we know that new life is truly in you. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen.